But I think many, many of us here have, have this feeling that we were interested in fascism and anti-fascism uh, long before it became fashionable. And it's one of few conferences that actually has fascism and anti-fascism in its title. Um, and uh, I think there is also um, a theme uh, um, in, in, in many of the presentations we heard about you know, different, different country cases. Um, when it was stressed that one of the main issues or the main challenges um, has been the denial of the very existence of the fascist movement or fascist tradition in, in many of the countries that, uh, 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 that we discussed. And uh, uh, Poland would be one of those cases. I would argue uh, that Poland uh, has had a specific political tradition that you can call fascism easily. Um, but it is a description that is often rejected. And it is often, uh, it is often controversial. Um, one of the first instances uh, when fascism was actually used as a, as a reference point in, in, in Polish political discourse in a positive way um, happened in December of uh, 1922 uh, during the demonstrations uh, that preceded uh, the assassination of the first uh, president of Poland, uh, uh, Gabriel Narutowicz, um, um, who was shot um, by a um, far-right um, uh, fanatic, Eligiusz Niewiadomski. And during those demonstrations against the election of uh, um, uh, President Narutowicz uh, uh, by the Polish parliament, uh, one of the main slogans was, thank you, uh, was long live Polish fascism. Uh, that was in December 1922. Uh, well, since then, uh, there have been many more uh, instances of uh, um, looking at fascism as a model uh, for political movements uh, in Poland, uh, but certainly, especially since World War II, it has been very rarely used as a, as a self-description. Uh, well, some years ago, I, I wrote a modest book that was uh, published by the Polish Academy of Sciences on the ideology of neo-fascism, and uh, in this very modest book, I tried to uh, uh, coin my own definition of fascism, uh, which is a very ambitious undertaking, of course, and I think it's not a bad <laughs> definition, despite uh, 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 it's, it's not really uh, uh, known outside of Poland, because the book was only published in Polish. Um, uh, and I could sum it up in, in one phrase that you could squeeze into a tweet, which is always good for uh, <laughs> for a summary of, of the book. Uh, uh, fascism could be uh, described as the politics of total cultural homogeneity. Um, and if we use that definition, uh, 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 certainly uh, there have been uh, um, political movements uh, 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 throughout the 20th century in Poland and also in the 21st century that, that definitely fit uh, that uh, description. Well, one of those movements was the Greater Poland Camp, uh, which was established in 1926 by Roman Dmowski. Roman Dmowski is a well-known name in, in, uh, in Polish history, the founding father of, of Polish ethno-nationalism. And he openly uh, um, um, admitted that he built uh, this organization on the Italian fascist mo uh, model. Um, but there were other, other groups, uh, such as the ONR, National Radical Camp, uh, uh, which was uh, established in 1934. And interestingly, it was uh, banned uh, um, also in 1934 uh, by, by, the, by the Polish authorities. But it existed semi-legally. <coughs> Uh, until uh, until 1939, and I think the ONR 
uh, the national radical camp, the national radical movement, is the closest that Poland had uh, to, uh, uh, mm, uh, to the fascist m m model known from, um, from other uh, uh, European uh, states. It, then it split into two groups. One was called Falanga. I guess that sounds familiar, and that's not accidental, of course. Um, uh, the ONR never seized power in Poland, of course, um, but it became very influential, especially among the younger generation in the late 1930s, and especially in universities, which I think is an interesting and important detail uh, to remember. Uh, but there were many other groups, I don't want to, to list all of them. One was called Zadruga, which was a neo-pagan group. It differed from the other groups I mentioned in, in, in the um, rejection of Christianity as a Jewish invention. And of course, being anti-Christian and anti-Catholic in particular doesn't really uh, um, get you far in the Polish context, uh, uh, but th they tried. And, 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 and those, those traditions, in one way or another, have survived until today. Each of those uh, uh, traditions uh, uh, survived uh, until today. And uh, the kind of godfather of contemporary Polish uh, nationalism, um, Jędrzej Giertych, uh, had an interesting thing to say back in 1938, I think. Uh, it's a short quote I will read out. We are one of those movements like Italian fascism, German Hitlerism, Portugal's Salazarism, Spanish Carlism, and Falangism, bringing down the old Freemason, plutocrat, socialist Jewish system and building a new order, a national order. Okay, so obviously there is a lot of self-awareness in this quote. Uh, comparing the Polish movement to, to the other European movements. And it is uh, Jędrzej Giertych who has played a very important role in the continuity of the tradition. He, um, he was a prisoner of war uh, in '39. He, he actually escaped from the prisoner of war, uh, um, the POW's camp. Uh, in Germany, uh, uh, lived in uh, Great Britain for many years. He, he, he died in the 80s. And he spent all those decades working on the continuation of, of this particular radical nationalist uh, uh, tradition and with, with much success because the contemporary movements, many of them or the majority of them, look at Jan J. Giertych as the ideological, um, as the ideological um, 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 uh, guidance. Uh, well, I mentioned the war already, and uh, and I think World War II is is a very interesting uh, and in some ways confusing period um, if you look at the Polish radical nationalists, uh, because not many of them, not many of them were collaborators, and uh, of course Poland is often referred to as a country without collaboration, which is partly true, uh, but there was no organized political collaboration in Poland, most of the time. Uh, and you could, you could ask a question why, and you know, a big part of the answer would be because the Nazis didn't want it. Uh, but, uh, uh, but many of the national radicals, uh, they ended up in the anti-German underground which you couldn't really call anti-fascist underground, but it was anti-German. Um, which explains largely why this particular tradition wasn't delegitimized as a result of World War II in the eyes of many, uh, many Poles. And also uh, it is a, an important part of the, um, of the controversy uh, around Polish fascism today. Um, there was one armed group in particular that, uh, uh, um, that has played an important role in the story, the National Armed Forces, Narodowe Siły Zbrojne, NSZ. Uh, 
uh, which were outside of the main line resistance, outside of the home army, uh, um, um, formed by the activists of the national radical camp from before the war. And um, they considered uh, uh, the Germans as their enemy, but uh, also, and more importantly, they considered uh, the Soviets as their enemy, and they considered Jews as their enemy. Uh, so they did not revise the anti-Semitic uh, um, ideology um, uh, from the 30s. Um, and the heroization of, of this particular organization, the NSZ, in contemporary uh, debates is a, is a very important element of, um, of, the, uh, of the discussions in Poland now. Um, now, the, the, the leader of, of, of one of the groups I mentioned, Falanga, had a very surprising career in Poland after 1945. Bolesław Piasecki, who was probably the best known Polish fascist leader, he actually reached um, a kind of agreement with the communist regime that allowed him to continue as a political activist under a different name, um, uh, uh, of, of, the, of the group, uh, which was renamed PAX, PAX Association, um, which um, created a mixture of socialist, Catholic, and nationalist uh, ideology, um, uh, which attracted people from the old far right um, in the service of the communist regime. Um, which was, of course, paradoxical, uh, but, it, but that also tells you something about the, the, the communist regime in Poland and possibly other Eastern European states that had a high degree of toleration of, uh, of acceptance of, uh, of nationalism despite all the internationalist Marxist uh, rhetoric on, on the surface. Uh, so Pax, together with uh, Bolesław Piasecki, uh, existed for decades under the communist regime with its own newspapers, with its own representation in the communist-dominated parliament. And Bolesław Piasecki himself uh, uh, died in 1979 as a member of the State Council, which was the collective head of state in, in communist Poland. That's, that's a high position, of course, despite everybody knew his uh, uh, um, uh, his, his fascist background in, 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 the, in the 1930s. Uh, I, mentioned, I mentioned this just to make sure you, you, you understand uh, uh, what I'm trying to say about the continuity of the, uh, of the, of the, of the fascist tradition in Poland. Uh, but I also want to stress the contemporary phenomenon uh, which uses the, 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 the Polish fascist tra uh, 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 tradition is not just a replication of, of this historic model. Um, I think it is much more complex than that. And occasionally we hear um, you know, simplistic analysis of Eastern European cases uh, um, uh, along the lines of um, you know, uh, old traditions that are defrozen after communism. And I, I think that's not exactly the case. It's not about freezing and defreezing political traditions and I don't really believe in the metaphor of society as a refrigerator. I, I, think, I think that's not really very, very accurate. Um, uh, uh, so of course those, those traditions play a role as a kind of cultural resource, as a reference point for the contemporary mo movements, but, but the contemporary movements are, uh, are a contemporary product of uh, of social and, 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 and political processes. So I, I want to jump now to, uh, uh, to contemporary Poland, and I will not try to describe the, uh, the whole spectrum of, 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 of the contemporary populist uh, radical right in Poland, but I want to use one example of one event that has uh, uh, become a very significant event, not just in the Polish uh, 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 far right um, uh, spectrum. It is the Independence Day march on the 11th of November uh, that I suppose many of you um, 
may have heard about. It's the annual march in Warsaw uh, that started in 2009 um, with a group of maybe 500 people, mostly skinheads, uh, uh, with nationalists and uh, in particular um, anti-Semitic slogans who marched through Warsaw city center. Um, the next year um, it was bigger. Um, in 2010, I remember I um, I watched it uh, uh, in front of the Royal Castle in, in Warsaw, and they mobilized about 3,000 people. And I thought, well, that's a big number for the far right to mobilize. Um, and I was very naive uh, because uh, that was just the beginning of the growth of, of, of this event. Um, which became bigger and bigger every year, and in the last years it attracts um, um, anything between 50,000 and 100,000 participants, uh, which makes it, I believe, the biggest far-right gathering in, in Europe or anywhere. Um, and uh, because of its size and of its sort of spectacular character, it has uh, uh, attracted um, neo-fascists and, and far-right extremists from, from other countries as well. So each year there are hundreds of uh, Jobbik members from Hungary who are um, uh, participating in, 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 in this march. Um, um, Roberto Fiore would be a name that, that's familiar to, 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 to many of you. The Italian uh, fascist leader was a keynote speaker last year. And uh, this year Richard Spencer was going to come as a guest uh, star. Uh, but he just cancelled two days ago um, after protests and also after uh, a statement of the Polish foreign ministry that disapproved of, of, of his visit. Uh, and mm, So this is possibly the, 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 the biggest far-right uh, gathering in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and I think it is not accidental that the organizers come from two uh, specific groups. Um, one of them is the ONR, National Radical Camp, which is now recreated as a youth movement in Poland, and obviously it is not accidental that they take the name from the group that had existed in the, in the 1930s. The other group is the All Polish Youth, which is another contemporary youth movement, which also takes its name um, uh, from an anti-Semitic nationalist uh, uh, youth organization that was active in the 20s and, uh, and, and the 30s. Um, and I think that the growth of this event uh, could, could serve as an example of the, of the spectacular growth of the influence of the far right in Poland, especially um, uh, among the younger generation. And all the statistical data that is available show, shows that it is actually the younger people, uh, people who were uh, born or socialized in the new democratic system who are actually more prone uh, to, um, to radical nationalism and, um, and radical xenophobia than their parents and, and even grandparents, which is in many ways a paradoxical finding, uh, but it's very real. and. Uh, and I think, well, in some ways it is, it is very sad. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is, uh, is uh, the blaring of distinctions uh, uh, between uh, the extreme right, the far right, the populist radical right, which I think especially in the German context is, is often... Um, uh, very, um, very, very present, and you know, especially the general distinction between the mainstream conservatives and uh, and, and and the extreme right, which is you know probably never never that simple, uh, but nevertheless it exists. Uh, in the, in the Polish case, in the last uh, couple of years, I think those distinctions uh, uh, dissolved, uh, and it is no longer possible, or at least it's very, very difficult to, to make those distinctions. Um, so 
what has been referred to as, as the anti-fascist minimum or the anti-fascist consensus or, or just the general liberal democratic consensus in the case of Polish politics that, that doesn't really exist anymore in my view. Um, and it has collapsed over the last two years in a, in a, in a, in a spectacular uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a spectacular way. Uh, let me give you again just one or two examples uh, to illustrate this. Um, the Polish parliament passed a vote um, honoring uh, the NSZ, the armed group I, I talked about before, the National Armed Forces, uh, um, uh, which was anti-Semitic, uh, um, anti-communist, which continued the Polish fascist tradition despite it was anti-German. Um, actually, the National Armed Forces also had a unit that collaborated uh, with, with the Nazi uh, uh, military, um, and they withdrew together with, uh, with the Nazis uh, uh, from Poland to, to the west of the Czech Republic in 1944-45. The Polish Parliament passed a vote of honor, honoring uh, the NSZ, um, which included a, a, a paragraph uh, a, praising this particular unit, Brigada Świętokrzyska, the, 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 the brigade uh, that withdrew together with, uh, with the Nazis uh, to the Czech, Czech Republic. Uh, and that, that would be disturbing enough, that, that is shocking enough, that would have been difficult to imagine in the 1990s. But I think what is more important and in, in some ways more shocking is, is the fact that this uh, um, vote in the Polish parliament was unanimous. Uh, meaning nobody voted against or nobody even abstained including the members of parliament from the opposition liberal parties, uh, which I think is very telling of the kind of hegemony, if you like, uh, of radical forms of nationalism in Poland today. And of course we know no hegemony is ever complete, but in, in this case, uh, in, 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 the, in, in, in the case of the Polish parliament and this particular vote, it was complete. It was 100% uh, in favor of, of this really uh, you know, problem, problematic motion. Another example, I think I should finish soon, yes. Uh, uh, so the last example uh, uh, is, is something that happened uh, just uh, a few weeks ago, I think, uh, it was the first weekend of October. Um, it was the National Prayer Day Against Islamization, uh, uh, which uh, happened on the anniversary of the Battle of Lepanto, uh, which has nothing to do with Polish history, in fact. Uh, uh, but it was a battle of Christians against Muslims. And uh, as you may know the Muslim community in Poland is very small. It, it is about 30,000 people in a, a 38 million country. So I, I would say there is no imminent perspective of Islamization of Poland. Uh, but the resistance <laughs> against Islamization is a very important part of mainstream political discourse today. So this National Prayer Day uh, 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 happened um, along the Polish borders, all around Poland, and also in the airports, because the airport is also the border. Um, um, the, the organizers wanted to attract one million participants. I'm not sure if they attracted that many, but definitely hundreds of thousands of people took part in, in an event that a few years ago would have only attracted a handful of far-right uh, activists. Uh, but again, maybe, m just as importantly, um, the Prime Minister of Poland also endorsed this uh, activity. Um, the President of Poland didn't endorse it and he, uh, he was very much criticized by his own supporters for not participating in the National Prayer 
uh, day against Islamization. So he had to defend himself and explain himself by saying, yes, I also prayed uh, uh, against <laughs> Islamization, but in, in, in private, so without cameras. Uh, <laughs> which again, I think, shows the, um, um, in some ways, you, you could call it the critical mass of, uh, um, of nationalism, also with, with you know the, 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 the more sort of radical exclusionary forms of, of, of nationalism uh, that is very mainstream in, in, in Polish political discourse today. Um, I, have, I have more examples that I, I, I would not use uh, uh, because of, of lack of time, but I, I was very uh, happy to see. Uh, the name of Paweł Machcewicz in the, in the, in the program for, for this afternoon. I, I don't think he's here yet. Uh, uh, but he, 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 he will probably talk about one of the main battlefields in, the, in, the, in, in current Polish politics, which is, um, uh, which is so-called history policy. And, uh, and you know, uh, the problematic use of the, of the word liberation, for example, which is... Uh, um, well, which is more or less officially rejected now in the official discourse of uh, uh, World War II um, and uh, um, uh, the changing of street names, the removal of monuments, uh, uh, which is official state policy in the last, in the last two years, is, is, is something that's very topical um, and, and, and something that is, that is very problematic. So we can talk more about it during this session or, 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 or later in the afternoon, and I, I thank you for your patience.